Long ago at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. What is the greatest love story that you have ever had? What is your favorite go-to love story? What's your favorite go-to movie about romance, about love? I'm sure that you uh, probably all know uh, the most famous love story, potentially, uh, which is Romeo and Juliet, right? Have you ever been to the play of Romeo and Juliet? You've probably at least heard their names because it is one of the greatest love stories of all time. I've got a picture here of a playbill from Romeo and Juliet, the story uh, of two star-crossed lovers, two star-crossed lovers who, because of their family squabbles, uh, they can't be together, but they find a way to be together, and of course, it's a great ending because they both die. I don't think that that's a really great love story. I'm sorry, William Shakespeare, you're a British man just like me, but if both people die at the end, that's not great. What about the story of Lancelot and Lady Guinevere? I've got a picture here of a, an artist rendering of them. Have you ever noticed how in, in old school medieval British pictures, both people look kind of unhuman, right? It's, it's, it's not a really great uh, sign for my country that my countrymen at one time drew like this. I think we've gotten better. But the story of Lancelot and Lady Guinevere is the story similar to Romeo and Juliet of two kind of star-crossed lovers. Uh, we have Lancelot who serves King Arthur. He is his uh, most beloved knight. And then Lady Guinevere is King Arthur's wife. So again, this is, it's not really going well, is it? Because it turns out that they uh, are not really supposed to be together because she's someone else's wife. So there's no romance there. Well, we could go on. We have got Robin Hood and Maid Marian, another tale of of British love, right? This is, uh, I believe, from the Errol Flynn movie. And uh, this is the story of Robin Hood who fights for the poor uh, and, and across that kind of saves Maid Marian from the sheriff. Uh, we could talk about maybe a more contemporary love story, uh, the love story of Johnny Cash and June Carter. Uh, these two people, in many people's eyes, have this amazing relationship, this amazing love. There was a movie made about it called Walk the Line the story of how Johnny Cash and uh, June Carter came together. But again, when we really get into the details, it's not overly romantic because they were both married to other people and kind of separated to be together. So it's a little awkward. Now, one of the most recent love stories we have, and one of my favorite, is Prince Harry and Meghan Markle. This is a true love story, folks. Now, I, I am very, very... Uh, disheartened that the royal family would allow American blood into our royal family. <laughs> but I can let it slide. I am a big fan of America. Uh, but a lot of people watch this wedding. Right? People love this because this was the story of, of in, in many ways, an ordinary girl finding her prince, falling in love, and having this amazing, beautiful wedding. It was watched by hundreds of thousands of people, millions of people around the world. Uh, I remember being uh, on a trip with my wife when this wedding was going on, and we saw on all of the news channels, everyone was covering it. Because we all love love stories. We all really get excited about these stories of romance and of, of two lovers that deeply love and value one another and want to be together. And I think that we love these stories because beneath the surface of every love story we've ever had is this truth about being wanted about being valued, about being desired. And even if we are not involved in a romantic relationships ourselves, we all want that in our lives. We all want a relationship in which we are deeply valued and wanted. We want the story of a lover who comes after us, who chases after us, who fights for us. We all long for meaningful love in our lives. When uh, G.R. Tolkien and C.S. Lewis were friends, C.S. Lewis wasn't a Christian initially, and he would talk to G.R. Tolkien about his apprehensions about believing in Christianity. And what G.R. Tolkien said to convince C.S. Lewis is he says, your love of myths and stories, C.S. Lewis, your love for all of these fairy tales, the reason why you love them is because even though those stories are fictional and untrue, they all of them have this truth beneath them, this idea beneath them that is true, that is not fictional, about a hero, about a rescuer. Last week, we started this series on Jesus and the prophets, and we heard how many of the stories of the prophets, these predictions, these prophetic messages, 
were stories that spoke to a truth, that spoke about something coming. I think that we love these stories about romance and love because there is a deep truth to them. Just as Tolkien told C.S. Lewis, there's something more to these stories. I think even in the most kind of goofy and, and disbelievable romantic stories, there is a truth about being wanted, about being valued, about being in a meaningful relationship. And it's something that we're all looking for. And the prophet that we read today, Hosea, is a very interesting love story. In many ways, it's a very broken love story. And when we read it, we can get very uncomfortable about some of the things that's said in it. But it is a love story nonetheless. And I think that it speaks to and points to the greatest love story of all time. Hosea is one of my favorite books in the Bible to read, despite some of the challenges in it. Because the message of this book is about a lover who pursues his beloved. Even in the midst of darkness and brokenness. And I want to caution us as we begin, Hosea doesn't pull any punches when he tells us this story. He tells us a very graphic story, a very intense story. One that's in many ways very difficult to go through. There's language in here that the prophet uses that can make us feel very uncomfortable. There's images that he uses. But I want to help us walk through this, however briefly we have this morning. Because what's behind it, what's beneath it all, the truth that is hidden within Hosea's message is about the greatest love story of all time. So let's look first at the story of unrequited love, and then the story of unshakable love, and finally the story of unconditional love. Would you read with me? We're going to be in Hosea chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. This is Hosea's story. The Lord said to me, Go again and love a woman who is loved by another man and is an adulteress, even as the Lord loves the children of Israel, though they turn to other gods and love cakes of raisins. So I bought her for 15 shekels of silver and a homer and a lethek of barley. And I said to her, You must dwell as mine for many days. You shall not play the whore or belong to another man. So will I also be to you. For the children of Israel shall dwell many days without king or prince, without sacrifice or pillar, without ephod or household gods. And afterward, the children of Israel shall return and seek the Lord their God and David their king. And they shall come in fear to the Lord and to his goodness in the latter days. The first part of Hosea's story is a story of unrequited love. Unrequited love. Uh, when I was in middle school and high school, uh, I wasn't quite as cool as I am now. Um, and I was very much chasing the girls. I wanted to have a great love story like all of these movies and stories that I'd read. Uh, and I was kind of a hopeless romantic. I thought that the way to get a girl to fall in love with me was to just be over-the-top romantic. My caution to anyone who thinks this, they will think that you're a stalker. So don't do it. <laughs> but uh, there was one girl in particular that I really liked. Uh, and uh, when you're a high school boy, you're infatuated, you're completely lost in your love. Uh, and so I chased after this uh, girl, and I was willing to do absolutely anything. Now this girl in particular, she kind of let me believe that perhaps there was some magic there, there was some chemistry. And I remember one Valentine's Day in particular, she said, if you get me some flowers, and you get me some really, something really nice, then maybe we can go out on a date. Uh, you already know what's going to happen, right? It, I don't even need to finish the story. So I went out in my hopeless romantic state, and I thought, yes, this is it. The most beautiful gal in school is going to go on a date with me. So I went, and I found the most beautiful flowers I could find on a high schooler's uh, pocket money. And I went out, and I found some chocolates. And I come to her door, and I knock on the door, and she goes, thanks, bye. I was devastated, guys devastated. I had put out my heart there. I had gotten these amazing gifts, these beautiful flowers, but it was unrequited love. And we all have stories like that, or we know someone who has a story like that, a story of, of loving someone and wanting to give your heart to someone who doesn't always want to give it back. And Hosea's story can't really be appreciated until we first understand that it's a story about unrequited love. There's a sadness at the beginning of Hosea's story because it's about a love that isn't returned to him. Hosea is illuminating for us the fact that God loves us far more than we love him. God loves us far more than we love him. And in fact, quite often, he loves us when we don't even love him at all. At the beginning of chapter 3, 
the Lord speaks to Hosea and he says to him, go again and love a woman who is loved by another man and is an adulteress. Even as the Lord loves the children of Israel, though they tend to other gods and love cakes of raisins. One of the most challenging things perhaps that God has ever asked of a man to go love a woman who's an adulteress, who doesn't love you, and not only doesn't love you, but is giving herself to other men. Hosea is a prophet during uh, a time in Israel's history uh, where there was a king called Jeroboam II. Uh, it was a very interesting time in Israel's history. At this point, Israel has been divided in two. Uh, we're about 800 years before the birth of Jesus, somewhere around 750 BC. And uh, at this time, Israel is living in relative peace uh, and prosperity. Jeroboam II has been able to hold together this dynasty that's been going on for a couple of hundred years. And although the nation's divided into Israel and Judah, things are going well. They are uh, relatively safe. They don't have too many enemies around them. There's Assyria who's always a threat, but things are going well. There's relative prosperity and wealth. It's a great time from a certain point of view. Because although the country seemed stable and the circumstances of the people's lives seemed stable, there was a spiritual and a moral brokenness to them. Jeroboam II was not a good king. He was not a fair king or a caring king or a loving king. Jeroboam II permitted all kinds of very broken things to go on under his rule. Most importantly, the worship of idols. Jeroboam II was uh, kind of inviting of, of something called Baal worship. And this was the worship of other idols. And throughout Israel's history, uh, worship of Baal had included things like child sacrifice and all kinds of abusive rituals. And God had told Israel again and again, I don't want you to worship these foreign gods. I don't want you to give yourself to the foreign gods because I am your God. I am the one that rescued you from Egypt and brought you into the land filled with milk and honey. I'm the one who's provided for you and loved you and given myself to you again and again. But at this time in Israel's history, the people were very forgetful of who God was. The people were very distracted. Despite the fact that God had provided them with this home and things were going relatively well, God's name was not on his people's lips. They had forgotten much. Even the Mosaic law and the, the covenant which God had given to his people and promised himself to his people had been largely forgotten about. And so God comes to a man named Hosea. He comes to him and asks him to prophesy, to speak to his people and to give them a message. And here is what God tells Hosea to do in the midst of this, in the midst of this broken society, in the midst of this tragedy of people that have forgotten him. Hosea is asked by God to marry a very promiscuous woman named Goma. God says, I want you to go and marry a woman who is an adulteress. A woman who is known for not being faithful. Goma was almost certainly a prostitute. It's not simply that she had lapsed morals. She was actively employed as a woman of the street. And God tells him to do this very much on purpose because this is the way in which Hosea is going to learn what God's relationship with Israel is like. It's very interesting because God doesn't simply want to tell Hosea something. He wants Hosea to experience it. He wants to create a set of circumstances for Hosea in which Hosea will learn this by feeling what God feels with his people. By knowing what it is like to be God and to love a people who don't love you. Now, it's very interesting that God chooses to do this, not simply through any kind of relationship, but through a marriage, through a marriage covenant. And the reason being is God's relationship to human beings is very much like a marriage. And in fact, throughout the Bible, God uses marriage as an illustration of his covenant and his relationship to us. The prophet Isaiah, when he's talking about God's love, says that the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. The Old Testament talks about God as our bridegroom, as the one who loves his people. And the reason it does this is because God is like the husband of the church. He is the one who has promised himself to us to care for us and provide for us. To be with us until death do us part. 
I mean, when you marry someone, that relationship is going to take precedence over every other relationship in your life. When you marry someone, you are saying to them, I want you more than everyone else. I want you to be the one that I give my life to, the one that I share my life with, the one that I walk through my life with. And so what God is doing is he's saying, that's what my relationship with you is supposed to be like. We are supposed to be bonded and united in such a way that our relationship, our relationship with God takes precedence over every other relationship. Over our relationship with friends, over our relationship with family. God wants us to put him first in the way that a wife loves her husband. See, God doesn't just want to be a part of our life, he wants to be the focus. In Hosea 2.20, God is comparing his relationship to marriage again. He says to Hosea uh, that I will betroth you to me in faithfulness and you shall know the Lord. Now that word know in this part of Hosea is a Hebrew word yada. And yada is a very, very interesting Hebrew word. It means to know in a very intimate sense, right? The, another part of the Bible in which this is, is used is in Genesis when Adam knew his wife Eve and they give birth to a son. So what God is saying is, I don't just want you to know me intellectually. I don't want you to just know about me. I don't want us to have a relationship in which we just kind of exchange truths. But I want you to know me in a deep, meaningful, experiential sense. God wants his people to experience him, to know him in the deepest and most intimate of ways. That's what God longs for with his people. That's what God has always promised to us in his covenant. But unfortunately, God tells Hosea that his marriage with his people is broken. That there is an unrequited love. That though God wants relationship that is intimate and experiential, unfortunately, we have forsaken that. We don't know God in that way. We don't love God in that way. So Hosea marries Gomer, this woman who has a reputation for unfaithfulness. And God says, that's the pain that I feel, Hosea. That pain that you feel when you love someone who doesn't love you back, who doesn't want you, who chases other men and gives her heart to others instead of you as her husband, that's what I feel when my people give their hearts to foreign gods and to other things. That's the pain that God feels when he loves his people Israel and again and again they forget him. Now this is an incredibly important message for us as Christians. This is important to us understanding what the Christian message is and what the gospel is because if we don't fully embrace the discomfort of this story, we won't understand the depth of God's love for us. If we don't understand what it costs God to love us, we won't understand his love because God's love for us is costly. God's love for us is unbalanced. He's not getting back from us what he is giving to us because we are all of us far worse than we dare admit. But we are far more loved than we can possibly imagine. Just like Hosea's wife, we are terrible at loving the one who has loved us. But in God's sense, he didn't just love us, he loves us perfectly, completely, unceasingly. Jesus' good friend John puts it this way when he writes his letter in the New Testament. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he has loved us. And sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. This is perhaps my favorite verse in the Bible, and he's the reason. How amazing is it that God would love us despite our inability and our failure to love him back. How amazing is it that over countless centuries and millennia, God has pursued a people that don't pursue him? That God has given himself to people who forget him, betray him, and walk away from him? That he loves us so completely? When you think about it, that Bible verse from 1 John is not necessarily something that you would be excited about because it's saying you don't love God. It's easy to read that and think, ooh, this is not very encouraging. The Bible's telling me I'm not very good. That I don't love God. 
But what it's telling you is, even though you don't, he still loves you. Even though you have not loved God, he has loved you. We live in the midst of a culture that shudders at the Christian message because there are so many stories of pastors and Christians who don't love God. Sadly, there are many stories that I could bring to mind even from recent history in our local area in which we hear the story of Christians and even pastors who don't seem to love God, who don't seem to give their all to Him. And so the world questions, why would I want to be a part of this You clearly don't love this God very well. But unfortunately, our culture has missed the point of Christianity. It's not about how much we love God. It's about how much He has loved us, despite the fact that we have not loved Him as we should. That's why this religion is so beautiful. That's why the gospel message is so beautiful. It is about a God who, despite feeling an unrequited love, still gives Himself to us. Still comes after us. We are so much worse than we dare admit, but we are also so much more loved than we can ever imagine. We are loved with an unshakable love, an unshakable love. We started by talking about our favorite love stories. One of my favorite love stories is Forrest Gump. Forrest Gump is a fantastic movie. I I joked with Jeff this week. He was a little upset about this, but I said, Forrest Gump is to me what C.S. Lewis is to you, Jeff. (laughs) I love Forrest Gump, and I will will take issue with anyone who says this is not the best movie in the world. And one of the reasons I love Forrest Gump is because it is a story very similar to Hosea about a man who loves a woman who doesn't love him back in the way that he hopes she will. The story of Forrest Gump, as you go throughout it, many, many interesting things happen to Forrest throughout the story. He does all kinds of amazing things. He meets presidents. He fights in wars. He becomes famous and wealthy. But the one thread that goes throughout the whole thing is that he loves this girl, Jenny. He chases Jenny. And throughout all the decades of his life, he finds that Jenny just doesn't love him back in the same way. Now, in many ways, Jenny can be forgiven for this because she's a very broken woman in this movie. She's experienced abuse. She's experienced all kinds of darkness. And in many ways, she is unable to give back to Forrest the love that he gives to her. But nevertheless, Forrest chases after her. Forrest goes after her. Again and again, he forgives her. He extends grace to her. He loves her. And in the end, Jenny and Forrest come together. Because he's loved her with an unshakable love. Because Jenny realizes in her brokenness, in her pain, that here is one who doesn't see her shame. Who doesn't see her guilt and her failure, but who loves her unshakably. Here's what God does next through Hosea to demonstrate and teach us about his love. He encourages Hosea to go and Hosea says, I bought her for 15 shekels of silver and a homer and a lethek of barley. And I said to her, you must dwell as mine for many days. You shall not play the whore or belong to another man. So will I also be to you. See, here's what we must see next, which offers us comfort in the midst of this very difficult story. Is that although God's love is in many ways unrequited, it's also unshakable. It's unbreakable. It's unceasing. God's love for you does not diminish because of your lack of love for him. God's love for you does not diminish in the slightest because you have failed to love him in the same way. I think we should all breathe a sigh of relief as we hear that. That God's love doesn't diminish for us. In fact, let's not breathe a sigh of relief. Let's breathe a sigh of awe that God would love us in this way. That he would do this for us. It's incredible. And you see, God wants Hosea to really get this. He wants him to see the price that he is willing to pay for his people, the lengths which he is willing to go to give grace and mercy to these people who forget him. So he sends Hosea out to find Goma, to love her and to redeem her. And we're told that in order to get Goma back, Hosea must pay a price of 15 shekels of silver and a homer and a lethek of barley, which was about the price in this day and age for a slave. It's not an astronomical amount, but it's costly. 
Now, why is he having to do this? Why does Hosea have to pay a price to get his bride back, his wife that has not loved him? How, why does he have to do this? Well, it's quite possible that Gomer's infidelity has landed her in a very dark place. The fact that Hosea is having to pay a price to get her back infers probably that in giving herself to other men, Gomer has found herself in debt. And now one of those men is selling her, potentially at an auction, as a slave in order to resolve her debt. We don't know all the details, but we can infer this from what is happening with Hosea, what he's doing. Imagine with me what this may have been like for Gomer to be in this position. This poor woman, who's no more broken, by the way, than you or I, is no more shameful than you or I, finds herself in the darkest moment of her life because of her choices, because of her failures. She stands now at an auction, being sold as an object. As she sought to find love in the arms of many men, now she faces the ultimate betrayal to be given away as though she's nothing the consequences of all her infidelities. She has fell as far down as a person can fall. And no matter who you are or how you end up in a position like this, it's not pleasant. It would be easy to label Goma in a way that says, well, she deserves what she's getting because of what she's done. But this is a broken woman. This is someone created in the image of God who has found herself in a very dark place. Now imagine as you stand as someone being sold as a slave at an auction, as an object, that you begin to hear the cries of men shouting out prices to bid on you. Five shekels. Imagine as you feel that wave coming over you, that you've become less than human in the eyes of a crowd. Something to be purchased like a commodity. And as the men's voices call out and you stand on probably what was a stage dressed in very little, you hear one voice call out. It's a familiar voice. It's the voice of the husband whose heart you broke. The voice of the one who you left, who you betrayed. The voice of the one who you didn't love as he loved you. He hasn't abandoned you. He calls out again higher and higher than all the other voices. Ten shekels. He hasn't abandoned his wife. He hasn't forsaken her despite the fact that she has forsaken him. And now he's outbidding the voices of the men that she betrayed him with. This is what God wanted Gomer to feel. See, Hosea is not just a story about what God wanted Hosea to feel. It's a story about what he wanted Gomer to feel. To feel the love that does not diminish despite her failures. That does not abandon her despite her failures. That pursues her and seeks her out and dives deep into the blackness of her mistakes and liberates her from it. And pays a price for it. Is willing to give a great price to get his wife back. God wants Gomer to know that she is dearly loved. And he wants Israel to know that they are dearly loved. He wants his people to know that he loves them unshakably. There are many of us in moments of our lives where we hang our heads in shame because of the choices that we've made and the people that we've hurt and the way that we have failed God. We hang our heads in shame knowing that if others knew the worst about us, they probably wouldn't want us. I have certainly felt like that in my life, knowing that there are choices that I've made, there are ways that I've wounded others who've loved me, and I just want to bury those things because to look at them is painful. But Paul writes to his dear friend Timothy, he says, If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. God cannot deny himself. When we are faithless, God will remain faithful to us. In our moments of great shame, he loves us still, and he will cover our shame and our guilt with the resounding call of his love for us. We are more worse than we dare admit. 
but we are more loved than we can ever imagine. We are fiercely pursued by God. We are chased after by God, despite the fact that we fail and betray. Because he has a love for us that is unconditional. His unconditional love. Hosea follows his story of retrieving Goma and loving Goma with a prophetic message from God himself. God speaks through Hosea in chapter 11, and this is what he says in Hosea 11, verses 8 and 9. How can I give you up, O Ephraim? How can I hand you over, O Israel? How can I make you like Adma? How can I treat you like Zeboim? My heart recoils within me. My compassion grows warm and tender. I will not execute my burning anger. I will not again destroy Ephraim. For I am God and not a man. The Holy One in your midst and I will not come in wrath. There is so much within that passage that we don't have time to fully dive into that is indescribably beautiful. God's compassion grows within him. His heart recoils within him. He can't give up Israel. Why? Why would God want people that don't want him? Why would God give himself to people that forget and forget and forget and forget? Because that's who God is. Because he is not a man. He is the Holy One in our midst. God's love for you is unconditional because God's not like you and he's not like me. He's not like us. Love is not just simply a choice or an option that he chooses. Love is who God is. It is the very fibers of his being. It is his nature. Remember, Timothy told us he can't deny himself. That's who he is. He cannot help but love and pour grace and mercy. Do you know why we forsake God so easily? Do you know why following Jesus can be tough for us? It's because often we forget who he is. We become consumed with what is asked of us and we, we become the center of our lives and the center of our marriage with God, so to speak, and we make everything about what we need to do. If we would just remember who he is, if we would just look at the beauty of this God who gives himself for people who can't give back to him, who devotes himself to people who are not devoted to him, wouldn't that liberate us to want to love him better, to serve him better? Because we know there is no limit to which with he will love us. Paul goes on later in the New Testament to say that our earthly marriage is like our marriage to God. That the marriage between a man and a wife points towards God. He says that it speaks of Christ in the church. Every experience of earthly love you've had with anyone is an echo of God's love. It's a shadow of God's love. It's a pale imitation. The story of all scripture is the story of God showing us his devotion and his faithfulness and his commitment. And Hosea is a snapshot along the way of what that love is like. And God gives us this very difficult, very painful, very graphic story so that we will not only know it, but so we will feel it. Hosea doesn't speak only about himself, he speaks of Jesus. Jesus is all the way through Hosea. It's the story of God come to pursue us in our infidelity, and that's who Jesus is. In Romans 5, 8, Paul writes, God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus is the true and better Hosea. Jesus is the one who chased after his wife. Jesus called himself often when he talked with people, the bridegroom, a very weird way to refer to yourself. And what Jesus was saying when he called himself the bridegroom is that that God in the Old Testament, the one who said he was the bridegroom of Israel, the one who encouraged Hosea, and said that that's what my love is like, Hosea, that was me. I am that God. Jesus is the one who has come to recommit God's vows to us, to pay a great price to retrieve us and redeem us. We all of us long for a better love story, and this is it. This is the better love story. Better than Romeo and Juliet. Better than Forrest Gump. 
This is the story of God's deep love for us. It's what we were made for. The story of Jesus. The one who came searching for his unfaithful bride. The one who finds us in our brokenness. The one who sacrifices his life for us. And pays for us not with a shekel, but with his own blood and body. He's the one who covers our nakedness and our shame with his own righteousness. The one who restores us as his precious bride and brings us home to dwell with him forever. You are far worse than you dare admit. And I am far worse than I dare admit. But we are together because of Jesus, far more loved than we can ever imagine. Would you pray with me as we finish this morning? Father God, I feel completely at a loss to truly capture the depth of the love that is in this book. It would take a lifetime to truly grasp and see all that you spoke through Hosea about Jesus. But Lord, thank you that Jesus is the true and better Hosea who comes to retrieve and redeem an unfaithful bride. Thank you, God, that for all of us in this room, Lord, who are far worse than we dare admit that you have loved us more than we can possibly imagine. Lord, may the story of Hosea ring in our ears forever so that we can know that you are the perfect bridegroom who loves us unshakably and unconditionally. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.